How can potentially incredibly successful careers be ruined by jealousy? But you know, when it gets out, it will kill me. Or what can a criminal past lead to when you're already at the top? Will become Britain's biggest ever robbery. These are nine UFC fighters who ruined their careers in the blink of an eye. And first, we're going to talk about Igor Severino. At only 20 years old, he debuted in the UFC. Perfect score, eight wins, eight finishes. It's a dream come true for many upcoming fighters, yet he messed it up in the most horrible way possible. Igor was facing another undefeated prospect, Andre Lima, who was also a debutante that night. Although he was losing the fight, Severino made sure to bring his dog out of him, and in the second round, he let him out. Holding his Brazilian compatriot against the cage, Igor bit him on the arm for no good reason, earning himself a one-way ticket outside the promotion. It was the first DQ via biting in UFC history. This is not tolerated in smaller organizations, let alone in the most elite ones. Severino is not even out of adolescence yet, but he is certainly out of the UFC. Illegal moves are just one way to dig your own grave, and Peter Yan knows that firsthand. If you are a fan of the bloodthirsty Siberian tiger, you probably suffered too, during the moment that changed the direction of his successful career. No Mercy arrived in the UFC in 2018 with an 8-1 record and very quickly caused a stir in the bantamweight division. After six dominant victories, Peter went all out on Jose Aldo to crown himself with a vacant title. With his mentality and fighting style, it looked like it would be a long reign, but things went sideways on the first title defense. The title challenger, Aljamain Sterling, had a difficult night through four rounds. Jan took him down whenever he wanted to and fed him with some heavy shots. The victory was on the horizon. But 30 seconds before the end of the round, Peter drilled Aljo with a blatantly illegal knee to the head following advice from his corner. For the first time in history, Sterling became the champion via DQ, and Peter went on to lose four out of six fights, destroying the perfect UFC streak. Yeah, it sucked. It was a good fight. I mean, that was a fight that everybody was excited about tonight. Everybody knew it was going to be good, and, uh, well, that's, that's a bad one. True. After the victory against Song Yadong, Yan returned to the winning column, but just one mistake cost him a lot. The question arises, how would the Russian's future have unfolded if he had lasted just 30 more seconds? Compared to the next fighter, Peter Yan's case looks harmless, and that's all because Rusamar Polares loved other people's body parts more than his MMA career. 19 wins and 16 submissions say a lot about his ground game expertise but the gift that was meant to be a blessing turned out to be a curse. In his fights, the Brazilian spammed wins with leg locks like crazy, but his problem was that when he took a leg, no one could separate him from it. The only reason this went on is that President White let this go a couple of times, but after Takino tried to take Mike Pierce's leg home to Brazil, Dana decided he had enough. And this is the second incident we've had with Paul Harris where he had the, uh, the lock and he didn't let it go. Finally, he let it go, but uh, I I'm going to cut him too. Rusamar sought his fortune in other promotions, but as karma always does its thing, he lost seven of his last ten fights and it was mostly by knockout. Not retiring when the time is right can destroy both career and legacy. One of those fighters is the indestructible Tony Ferguson, with seven consecutive losses. El Kukui was the interim champion with a 12-fight winning streak, who sliced and diced through the most dangerous fighters of the lightweight division. Five times he was paired with Nurmagomedov, but fans never had the honor of watching that fight. When Tony Ferguson was on this undefeated run, he was one of the baddest fucking men on the planet. The fact that him and Khabib never got to fight is a real fucking tragedy. Yeah. So that the fans would not be left without entertainment during the pandemic, Ferguson accepted the fight against Justin Gaethje for the second interim belt. Unfortunately, Justin pushed the limits of violence and gave Tony a beating he had never received. That was in addition to two weight cuts and not taking a long break to rehabilitate his knee. Of course, El Kukui came back, but he was never the same. Losing two more decisions against the top five fighters is not the worst thing, but losing four more fights with three finishes was putting nails in your own coffin. It has become very difficult to watch, especially for true fans or anyone sane on this planet. What did he do with Tony Ferguson? Uh, he took a lot of damage in that first round, but then he tried to fight back, and I think that's what, seven, six, seven losses in a row now. Nobody can be same long time. No Tony Ferguson, no Habib, nobody. And one day, someone gonna beat you or something gonna happen. You know, Tony Ferguson's time is finished. 
The use of illegal substances is a big no-no in the world of MMA, especially if you are an employee of the UFC promotion. Ruslan Magomedov comes in a slightly different edition than the others for fighters from the Republic of Dagestan because he competes in the heavyweight division. That is, he competed until he managed to do what no one before him had done. In a year and a half of competition in the UFC, Ruslan celebrated three times with victories until it was the turn of a new opponent, the United States Anti-Doping Agency. According to a USADA press statement, Magomedov tested positive for anabolic steroid metabolites in October 2018, marking his second anti-doping wrongdoing. On February 5th, he committed a third violation, refusing to submit an out-of-competition test. Magomedov previously served a two-year suspension from USADA due to a failed drug test on September 7, 2016. Because of this, the Russian fighter was banned from the UFC promotion forever, and when he returned to the Russian ACA organization, he lost two of his last three bouts and thus completely destroyed his career. It seems that the Dagestanis are not only dangerous for other fighters, but also for themselves. TJ Dillashaw destroyed his reputation when he moved up to flyweight to try to become a two-time champion. At the time, Henry Cejudo was wearing the flyweight crown and TJ was trying to take it away from him. Training camp and grueling weight loss, all that to be knocked out only 30 seconds in the first round. But the failure to capture the second belt is not the biggest fall that Dillashaw has experienced. And he could not even imagine that soon he would be without the bantamweight championship as well. USADA later revealed that TJ's pre-fight urine sample contained recombinant human erythropoietin, or Arhuepo, which is reportedly used to stimulate the body's production of red blood cells, thereby increasing oxygen transport and aerobic power. In short, you can train like a beast for a couple of hours with excellent stamina, endurance, and breathing easily. Although he drew the wrath of the MMA community upon himself, Dillashaw came out fair by voluntarily relinquishing the bantamweight title and accepting a two-year suspension. This is difficult to know. Every interview I do, I'm going to have to talk about the suspension and EPO and all that. Nah, man. I mean, that's kind of why I was so upfront about it anyways. You know, it's kind of like doing your own therapy and getting it off your chest right away. Everything's already been said. You know, I didn't hide behind anything. I put it all out there and uh, I'm a very mentally tough guy and uh, it's not going to ever break me. But even when he came back, he got past Corey Sanhagen in a controversial split decision decision, and later busted his title shot against bantamweight champ Aljamain Sterling in a fight that was painful to watch if you were a TJ fan. The funk master, like most people, wasn't happy about opponents' previous wrongdoings. If anyone's mentally weak is that guy. The guy needed steroids and EPO to, to catapult his career to even win as many fights as he did in the UFC, so his whole UFC tenure is tainted. Of course, it's very shameful to ruin a career because of doping, but at least TJ didn't end up in jail for a long time. The same cannot be said about Lee Murray who is pushing the boundaries of self-destruction. The Moroccan-English fighter had a promising record of seven wins, seven finishes, one loss, a draw, and no contest before joining the UFC. Judging by his life, where Murray participated in street fights, minor thefts, and assaults, it was evident that he was born to bring chaos. Days after Lee Murray got stabbed. He's walking around the vent with all the stitches still in him and everything's still fresh. Lee Murray is one of the most legit gangsters of all time. However, this is nothing, considering how he completely derailed his MMA career. The UFC saw off his talent when he reportedly knocked Tito Ortiz outside of the club, and given Ortiz and Dana White's relationship, it's no wonder Murray got a call from the promotion. Knocking out Tito on the street seems to be a good base for a quick entry into the UFC. Lee presented himself in the right light in his debut, where he finished Jorge Rivera with a submission in the first round to the delight of all who watched. However, his career did not see the final glory, and this remained the only fight in the promotion. The reason for this was complications with the US visa due to the ongoing criminal prosecution in the UK. Instead of a UFC career, he went to Cage Rage Promotion, where he fought Anderson Silva for the vacant middleweight title but the spider triumphed by unanimous decision. That would be it for Murray's MMA career, because he decided to break records, but not sports ones. 53 million pounds will be stolen, and Kent police are about to investigate what will become Britain's biggest ever robbery. Murray's fame grew after he orchestrated the largest cash theft in British history, with 53 million pounds stolen in an operation he oversaw in 2006. An organized attack saw a group of armed gang members flee a depot with cold hard cash. 
You can delve deeper by watching the Catching Lightning TV series that covers his troubled story. The investigation is developing at a fast pace. I went to an operational briefing and what I saw was daily determination from everyone around the room. The team are committed to catching everyone and I'm confident that we will do just that. When it was all said and done, Murray got trialed. And in addition to receiving a biographical documentary, he received 25 years in prison. However, no one's career has suffered because of USADA like Nick Diaz's. The older Diaz brother had a great streak in strike force, where he became the welterweight champion. After three title defenses, he returns to the UFC to try to reach their championship in the second run. But Nick Diaz came and did the most Diaz thing ever. There was so much weed in his system when they tested him that he had to be high when he was fighting. He failed the doping test twice due to the use of marijuana, which is far from a performance-enhancing steroid, but it was still an illegal substance at the time. I'm a, I know all the fighters, and they're all, all on steroids. All you motherfuckers are on steroids. It happened for the first time in the UFC against Carlos Condit and three years later against Anderson Silva. We won't even talk about his days in the pride. After the Silva fight, where Anderson also tested positive but for steroids, Nick was forced to serve a five-year ban by the Nevada State Athletic Commission because of weed. With a protest, he managed to lower the ban to 18 months, but due to his inability to pay the $165,000 fine, he was considered ineligible to fight. Nick, do you see something very wrong with Anderson Silva getting a one-year suspension and you getting a five-year suspension? That's ridiculous. Although he managed to find an agreement with NSAC, Nick did not compete and extended his hiatus to almost seven years. He returned only in 2021 against Robbie Lawler, where he lost the bout, not being even a shadow of the fighter he once was. Jonathan Coppenhaver is not the first fighter to raise his hand on his girl, but Jonathan did not stop at just one hit. Physically, War Machine, it, it, he could be a problem for anybody. But I'll tell you, mentally, he's definitely got some issues. Before serving punishment out of the cage, War Machine came to the Ultimate Fighter 6 finale with a 5-1 to one record, where he showed his prosperity. He earned fight and knockout of the night and got the opportunity to perform for the UFC. Although he lost his debut by submission, Jonathan made it worse when he refused an offer for another fight. His irresponsible behavior was accompanied by contentious statements about the death of former UFC fighter Evan Tanner. This later led to his permanent removal from the UFC roster. It was the stupid mistake that ruined his UFC opportunity, but Jonathan went on to completely ruin his whole life. Instead of war, John stuck to kidnapping and beating civilians. Already known to the police, Coppenhaver decided to collect criminal charges instead of MMA victories. His career and his life ended after he savagely attacked his ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend, for which he was charged with 29 charges and received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 36 years. I have been punched and kicked, smothered and bitten. I have been raped and tortured. I don't know if my life will feel complete in 12 years or 20 years or even 30 years, and neither do you. But as you know, when, when I get out, when he gets out, he will kill me. It's no excuse for Lee Murray, but at least he turned out to be a badass and legend in the eyes of the people, unlike Jonathan the Love Machine, who couldn't overcome his emotional instabilities.